Good afternoon to all. I'm Enrico Escher, Executive Director of the Frank J. Vitt International Society, and pleased to introduce this timely webinar. Under the leadership of our president, Professor Juan Parodi, we have invited a superb group of vascular surgeons to present and discuss the subject of how to promote Asian American vascular surgeons in both the academic and clinical arenas. When I was president of the Society for Vascular Surgery, I was invited to give a lecture to the South Asian American Vascular Society by Dr. Krishna Jain, who is here with us today. And only then I realized that there is a need to address some of the issues raised by the Asian American community. More recently, Dr. Veet and I had a long Zoom chat with the president of the Chinese Vascular Society to address some of his concerns regarding traveling to the US. The assault on innocent American uh, Chinese and American Korean citizens was disturbing to him. We assured him that these were sporadic cases and that most of the 18.6 million Asian American citizens are living well in the US. In fact, they are one of the most successful ethnic groups in this country. As you may know, year after year, we welcome hundreds of Chinese vascular surgeons to the V Symposium. Most of us recognize that we live in the best country in the world in terms of human rights and opportunities for a successful career. Yet, there is room for improvement for equality and equitable distribution of the opportunities available. Vascular surgeons must continue to ask provocative questions regarding gender and racial issues. Like Dr. Caligaro mentioned in our last published bulletin, all of us need to look at circumstances as if the situation was reversed for each of us. The entire leadership of the Frank JV Society is committed to continue to bring these subjects up for discussion. We believe the biggest lesson we learned from these webinars is that we all need to listen to each other and to build consensus. With great satisfaction, I now pass the microphone to our illustrious moderators, Dr. Skeet Caligaro, Chief of Vascular Surgery in Pennsylvania Hospital and Treasurer of the Society for Vascular Surgery, and Anil Hingarani, Associate Professor um, of Surgery at NYU. Both these gentlemen are nationally known and great contributors to our specialty. Keith, please. Yeah, thanks, Enrico. Um, yeah, first I want to thank Enrico and Anil for uh, you know helping to put this together. And um, I've had a long interest in in addressing the issue of uh, getting more people involved in our society. Uh, way back in 2008, when I was president of the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery, that was my topic of my presidential address. Um, the title was Without Prejudice, meaning we should all be inclusive. And during that presentation, I, I addressed the issue of trying to be more inclusive in terms of Asian Americans, women, and, and other minorities. So we, we still have a way to go, but I, I think we're all making an effort to do so. So uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, presentations and discussions and hopefully a lively uh, discussion at the end. Uh, Anil? So I wanna thank the organizers for putting together this uh, symposium. And I think this is a very important topic and very timely topic. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Lee, uh, who's gonna be giving a talk um, fresh out of the operating room and uh, just in time to give us an exciting talk. Dr. Lee? Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, first, I wanna thank um, uh, Frank uh, for uh, years of uh, friendship and uh, partnership, um, and then as well to the organizers uh, for this important uh, webinar and symposium today. I um, have a lot of fond memories over the last uh, 17 years of uh, interacting with everyone on the screen and I appreciate the opportunity to have a few minutes here to, to share some thoughts. So I was asked to talk about barriers and strategies for Asian Americans in academic uh, vascular surgery practice. Uh, some disclosures. Um, these, this is my late father and my mom with my three kids. Um, those that have uh, followed uh, world news uh, know that Myanmar or Burma is currently embroiled in um, uh, 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 violent acts of oppression. And uh, we should all be so fortunate to not be living in Burma, Myanmar right now. My, my, my mom and dad were born there. Uh, my dad was one of 13 siblings, my mom, seven siblings. Uh, they fled on boats to the United States in 1970. Um, 
I have 40 first cousins and or and 22 first cousins on my mom's side. I'm right in the middle of those 62. I'm number 31. The 30 older than me were all born in Burma. I was the first one born in the United States. Obviously, that kind of story, uh, parents prioritize education, work ethic, and taking every opportunity. So those are kind of my early disclosures about um, my thoughts about this topic today and uh, things that perhaps we can all do and try to do better. And I think we start with webinars like this to at least open the discussion. I was very fortunate in surgery training to meet with Rod White and Carlos Donair. This is a photo from my first SVS meeting in uh, 2001 in Boston. Um, Rod White gave me the opportunity to present at the podium. Obviously over the years, uh, my time at Stanford, uh, Chris Zarens was the, was, the, was the chief then, Ron Dahlman was our program director, Neil Alcott and John Harris trained me here in two, from 2004 and 2005. As I looked up things related to barriers, there's actually quite a bit of literature. So like any good presentation, you go to, the, uh, 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 to PubMed and you start to see what other more intelligent people have to say about this. Um, there's a Society for Asian American Surgeons, uh, Asian, uh, Asian Academic Surgeons, and um, many leaders across the country over the years have talked about this um, awareness needing to be brought up. This is an op-ed in the middle here from Pauline Chen, a top transplant surgeon at UCLA. She was a fellow when I was an intern, writing about workplace bias and showing up last month for a, for a transplant case in a small community hospital. They landed by helicopter, she and her white male intern, and the small community hospital addressed the white male intern first and said, what's our plan for the harvest today? Assuming that Pauline Chen was the nurse assist or the intern. And then this concept of I've, that I've spent the last week reading about this model minority or whether Asian Americans are an overrepresented minority. So there's literature replete with discussions related to this. And by disclosure, I feel like um, only through being asked to speak about this did I learn some more about it and had some time to think about this. So this is kind of my main slide as the barriers that are described. And then I have a slide about perhaps my thoughts about how we might overcome this. And I look forward to the discussion uh, in this next hour with uh, amazing colleagues on the screen. I think there is bias and racial stereotyping when we talk about Asians as a collective group. There is this thought that they are all homogeneous when as many on the screen know, there is South Asian, East Asian, West Asian, there's a huge difference between Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Burmese Americans. There's the concept when we assume that Asians are complacent and quiet. There's literature replete about Asians less willing to seek out promotions or raises because of the good fortune to be in the US where we just have an opportunity. And perhaps in my upbringing, part of that rings true, figuring that I was fortunate as I had the opportunity to have a free American education. And perhaps each time I tried to say, well, that's not fair. Or I didn't want to do that homework assignment. My mom would say, well, that's better than having to walk to school with trying to avoid landmines or trying to avoid the military persecuting you. I guess from that perspective, it was simpler just to get on the bus and go to school. <laughs> This concept of model minority, I think we all have examples of our teams that we build, residencies, lab groups, faculty, where um, having a team of folks that are um, uh, either respective or just happy that they had the opportunity can make a team very strong. And so there's this concept that perhaps fairly or unfairly, Asian Americans have been lumped into this model minority where nobody ever really talks about Asian Americans being the minority of the group. And in fact, everybody in California knows the jokes about the various public schools, UCLA being University of Caucasians lost amongst Asians, UC Berkeley now being over 50% uh, Asian American, and all the issues with recruitment 
of elite schools, Harvard, the Stanford of the East, uh, Stanford, and whether there's over-representation and whether those are the issues that I think when we speak about them out loud, hopefully we can come to some solutions. So what can we do? So these are thoughts I've put together this past week. So I think symposia like this, where we have an open discussion about diversity, and I know we've all sat on calls talking about diversity. We all sit on search committees where we have to find the URMs. We all sit on residency recruitment, fellowship recruitment things where we're trying to find traditionally underrepresented folks. Turns out Asian Americans, this is in 2019 data, is 6% of the US population. It's actually 18% of US physicians and it's 20% of medical school faculty. And of all, and this in the last AAMC, um, survey of all academic chairs of all clinical departments across the country, 10% deem themselves Asian Americans. I think things we can do, we want to design systems to reward excellence. And I think we want to encourage pride in the success of folks across the country, no matter what their race, gender background is. I think in systems like that, people will feel appreciated. People will be champions of uh, folks that succeed and there will be examples for the next generation to follow. I think, and I myself have not been that involved with the SAAS, but as I read through their website and I've lurked and looked at their program and looked at all the presidential addresses, which are all published in the Journal of Surgical Research, everybody focuses on things like mentorship opportunities, support and sponsorship. Very simple words for us all to abide by that everybody on this screen has spent their entire career doing. And I think that's what I would challenge the group, that that's what we need to do. Provide, continue to reward excellence, continue to strive for the best in ourselves and provide mentorship, support and sponsorship to our younger colleagues beneath us. So we need to lead by example. AAA is for available, affable and able. You need to be nice, you need to volunteer. Sometimes you gotta be lucky got to be at the right place at the right time. I think too often this next generation, and I have dealt with our trainees and residents uh, for the last uh, 12 years, you have to be patient. There's a time and place for being in the spotlight. There's a time and place for showing your excellence. I think we have to respect the system. We all have to believe in the future, and we always have to strive to be better and to learn more. I've been very fortunate and lucky in the position <laughs> position I've had the opportunity to be in and through a lot of folks on this screen that have helped me over the years, even just a phone call or a text or an add a boy or add a girl. Those are wonderful things that I think we often too forget. As surgeons, we spent a lot of time in M&M conference talking about things that went awry. And yeah, we guise it under, it's a learning opportunity. Sometimes I wish some of the time spent in M&M could just be, here's an amazing case that went really well. And we should celebrate that. I think we tend to forget that because we expect that that's the normal outcome. I'm humbled that Dr. Dahlman has allowed me to now lead the 18 faculty at our four sites at Stanford, 14 vascular surgeons, two vascular medicine physicians, one biomedical engineer, one PhD researcher. We've got 13 trainees. You can see the diversity in this. We've been purposeful about selecting the best and this is the entire group. I really look forward to the discussion today and really hope to set the plate here for our uh, discussion about things we can do and uh, biases we can all overcome. Uh, thank you, Enrico and Anil and Keith and Frank for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. One burning question from Dr. Kalra. Thanks, Jason. I had a little technical difficulty, but thankfully I had seen your slides uh, before. So my question to you is really uh, in this year's hot topic is uh, women Asian vascular surgeons and opportunities for them uh, as far as you know, mentorship is key. And you think that the women, you have a message for the women as to how they should approach this a little differently than the men? It's a great question, Manju, appreciate that. 
As everyone knows, more than 50% of people entering medical school are women. Um, in general surgery now, it's about 28, 29%. So the fellowship pool for vascular, if we're talking specifically about vascular surgery, the fellowship pool is a little less in terms of the, the, um, the farm team, if you will, of how we choose future vascular trainees. So I think the key and the message to women is to get them interested in medical school. I think one of the, on one of the slides, I talked about patience. I think that we, with showing excellence and showing good work and having groups like this talk openly about rewarding excellence, that over time, as the numbers increase in our specialty, then they will be as fairly represented. I guess I don't really have a different message for the men and women outside of the fact of just be as best as you can. Obviously there are, um, and, and being a parent myself, I think there are occasional um, barriers, if you will, uh, to uh, just being a mom versus a dad. I think those are touchy subjects. I think we have to talk about them openly to find solutions for them. And I'm always open to listen to those uh, conversations and to learn uh, from them. I don't pretend I've done it perfectly myself, but in this next role for me, very willing to listen and learn and uh, provide best practices to really support, mentor and sponsor everyone on our team. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Lee and Dr. Manju, appreciate it. Our um, next speaker is uh, Krishna Jain and he will be addressing how to develop a successful private practice in vascular surgery and what difficulties Asian American vascular surgeons face. Krishna. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, Keith, Frank, <clears throat> Anir and Enrico. Let's see if I can, for inviting me to talk about this. So let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, uh, let's see here. Share, there you go. Uh, okay, so, so this is my disclosure. Uh, so discrimination is inherent in human nature. We all discriminate. We like good food. We like good wine. We like good cars. So it is natural that we discriminate about things. But when it discriminations come into practices and how we uh, take care of patients, then it can be sometimes a problem. One can succeed though, because it is also in human nature to appreciate quality and compassion. Okay, let's see, my slide is not going to move forward. Let's see here, I can do it here. Okay, so I come from India, as you know, and uh, the Indian caste system is more than 5,000 5, years old. The caste system in ancient India was used to establish separate classes of inhabitants based upon their social position and employment, employment functions in the community. So the question is, is there a caste system in surgery? This is my perception, this is my perspective. So if you had to look at various categories, Dr. Kalra just asked a question about uh, female vascular surgeons. So if you had to uh, divide uh, people in different categories or different castes, so to speak, the top of the line would be white American male MD graduate. Next from my perspective would be white American male DO graduate. And then white American male IMG or international medical graduate, people going to Caribbean, et cetera to get their degree. The next set would be male surgeons, uh, for, for example, African-American, Asian-American, Latin-American. And the next in the category, it would be female surgeon. And the last would be Asian-American IMG graduate, a person like myself who came from India. So what are the challenges that are posed by this kind of system? You may call it a caste system, or you may call it a hierarchy, whatever you may want to call it. Uh, but first, of, first and foremost, there's difficulty in promotion. In, in an academic career. There's difficulty in getting leadership positions, difficulty in getting patient referrals in private practice. I face that quite a bit. Difficulty in getting recognition and support by the hospital administrators. Because if there's a competing physician who's in a higher caste system, uh, they tend to get the support of the hospital. So what are the challenges I faced? After my fellowship, I started off as an assistant professor. I was groomed to be an academician by my boss, Dr. Rush, who was very kind to me. I went to him and I was looking for a job and I was told that I'll be a very good professor, but never become chairman of the department. And just remember this was in 1981. 
things have changed to some degree because many of the Asian uh, vascular surgeons do run departments now and are program directors in many, many practices. In prior practice, hospital administrators always promoted other vascular surgeons who were at the top of the caste system. Many local physicians never referred a single patient to me. And occasionally a patient did not want to see a foreign doctor. That was very, that was, that was seldom. Usually they were very happy with the care we were providing. So we talk about three A's, how to succeed in private practice, availability, affability, and ability. But I've already added a fourth A, adaptability. For a person like myself who came from a different country, I have to adapt. Many people like me have to adapt. So for a person like me, adaptability is as important as the first three A's everybody talks about. So in, I'll just briefly talk about these things. Availability, never say no, never say no. When somebody's sending you a patient. I used to walk through the emergency room all the time and let them know that I'm available. If I was not on call and somebody called me, I always gave them advice. I did not say I'm not on call. And if the referring physician ever felt that patient needs to be seen urgently, I saw the patient. Affability, easier said than done. Never get mad at the referring physician. Never criticize the referring physician, private or public, because the private meetings sometimes tend to become public in future. Develop social relationship with them and their families, because then you have a bigger bond rather than just uh, somebody sent to your patient. Just be nice and respect coworkers and staff. That is extremely important because they are your ambassadors. They, they are the ones who tell others, other people how compassionate you are, how good you are. And, but if you're not nice to them, they will not be your ambassadors. Ability, it is given that you're a competent vascular surgeon because either you're board certified or board eligible. You take ownership of your complications, don't hide it. If there's a complication, accept it so that you can get better. And finally, collect data to show your competency at local, regional, national level, because data is power. So when it comes to adapting, this is the fourth A that I have added. This is where one has to consciously work as an Asian vascular surgeon. I came from a foreign country. The bound to be cultural differences between India and America, and I found them when I was here. One has to adapt culturally and socially, and do not expect others to adapt. For example, I used to like uh, cricket in India, and there's nothing like cricket here, very little. So I started following baseball, you know, because I had to adapt and learn another, uh, learn about another sport and fall, fall in love with the sport. How do you adapt your practice? As the practice referral system change, learn the system and be a part of it. As the technology changes, be an early adapter. As the government regulations change, have a dynamic practice that can adapt to the changes faster than the competition. Do not count on a few referral sources, create a large network. We had a network of 800 doctors referring to us. Create a vibrant outreach program and keep harmony in the group. This is very critical. If your group is not working together, it's just like a family, then the discord goes outside. So how did I adapt in Kalamazoo, specific using all these, uh, the, all these tools? I started nine satellite clinics in underserved areas. And then we started mobile non-invasive vascular lab to support the satellite clinics. These were clinics and 50 bed hospitals, 60 bed hospitals in the rural communities. We opened an OBL in 2007 to meet the dialysis access maintenance needs for the nephrologists. And this gave us 90% of the market share. We helped create a multi-specialty organization to help negotiate with the payers in the hospital. I became involved in the working of the Department of Surgery and became Chief of Department of Surgery. This gave me opportunity to work with many other doctors. I got involved in organized medicine and became president of Kalamazoo Academy of Medicine. This gave me an opportunity to work with many other doctors who I normally would not interact with, as well as work with the state and the federal uh, representatives. So in conclusions, I made the decision to come to America, to, uh, to America. I was not asked to come. There's discrimination in India as well. Overall, I've been very happy with my life in private practice. My family has been very happy. We were able to stop, help a lot of patients as a group. And despite challenges I faced, I'll do it all over again. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and everybody else for inviting me. Well, thank you, Dr. Jane. That uh, was a very optimistic uh, point of view, especially at the end, which I think we all appreciate. So um, Dr. Raju, uh, who is well known to all of us, is supposed to be the discussant. And Dr. Raju, do you have a... Can you get on uh, the audio? 
we were having trouble before and I guess not. So Enrico, did you uh, or Dr. Veith want to ask a question now or do you want us to read off Dr. Raju's comments? Dr. Raju is here, so you cannot... Right, I don't think the audio, his audio is not working. So I think maybe you yeah, could... Dr. J. Here already. Since he's here, maybe you can show his slides and you okay. can read the slides. That, that sure. would help. Thank you very much. So if we can pull up Dr. Raju's slides and uh, I'll, I'll read them off. Okay, I'll, I'll load them up. Thank you. Uh, we are all looking forward to uh, getting together again so we don't have these technical glitches. Uh, and I hope you're all going to be in San Diego, by the way. I'm taking call for Dr. Dahlman so he can go to the meeting. <laughs> all right. We'll miss you, Jason. I'll have a drink for you, by the way. Did, uh, so, David, we're, we're pulling up. Uh, there it is. Okay. So, all right. Uh, so, um, Dr. Raju had a few slides presented. I will uh, do my best to uh, present them as eloquently as he would. So, these facts are that the household income of Asian American is the highest in the economic pyramid. I did not know that. More than 50% of startups in Silicon Valley are Asian-led. Many key companies are Asian-led, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, Mike, et cetera, et cetera. And only a small percentage of Asian immigrants choose to return uh, back to their country of origin. A key consideration is what they see as prospects for the second, second and subsequent generations, despite challenges faced by the first generation. Now, this appears to be true uh, for most immigrants from the 200 countries that are here, and they are still <laughs> pouring in. Uh, there you go. Whoop. Uh, that's the first slide. Now we want to move on to the next slide. Oh, all right. I think that that was out of order, but we'll try to get through this. All right. So uh, he agrees that tribalism is primordial. Many, but not all, modern economics have anti discrimination laws. Several are still actively discriminate by law, custom, or actual practice based on racial, religious, gender, and other differences, including skin color. And he is urging us to examine what they do, not what they say. Uh, Dr. Raju contends that the USA is the least discriminatory uh, based on raw data. All right, next slide. So this is the facts we just read, emphasizing um, I think his point is how well Asian Americans or many Asian Americans are doing. So you can go to the next slide, I read that. So in conclusion, uh, he said that compared to their overall size, meaning less than 3% of, uh, of Americans, Asians are overrepresented, uh, estimated 15% in the medical profession. And uh, this is what some of the previous speakers were emphasizing. And despite the challenges, you can rise to the top in the U.S. if you try, and Dr. Krishna Jain himself and others on this panel. And um, Dr. Raju has traveled the world and would not exchange this beautiful country as home for anywhere else. God bless America. Well, Dr. Jain, thank you very, uh, Dr. Raju, thank you very much for those comments. Again, the, um, I think it's, it's beneficial for all of us to try to have an optimistic uh, point of view about things, but mm -hmm but obviously to address these, uh, these issues. And Dr. Raju, just personally, I wanna say, I've always admired your contributions to, to our specialty. You're, I, I think I referred to your name from an academic standpoint in terms of iliac vein stenting, uh, almost as much as Dr. Veith, actually. All right, so we're gonna go on to the, uh, to the next uh, presenter, uh, Anil. So Dr. Oko Sachdev is going to be giving the next talk. She's going to be changing focus a little bit and talking about um, uh, becoming an academic editor. Welcome, Dr. Sachdev. Hi there, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm just gonna start st sharing my screen in one second. Oh, 
Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Great, wonderful. Well, thanks again for this invitation. And um, I apologize, I'm a little late uh, coming to the webinar um, as I am on call today and was dealing with a clinical issue that ended up taking longer than I expected. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about what it takes to become an academic editor. Although I'm so new to the field that I'm not 100% sure that I'm actually uh, an expert on this, but I'll give it a shot. So thank you. So I thought that I would start by um, describing the path really of my parents who I really uh, credit with everything that I've been able to achieve here. Um, they were born during the British Raj uh, at a time where um, the country, where India was colonized. Um, and actually they weren't even technically born in what would now be called India. They were born in what is now Pakistan and made the very treacherous um, uh, transition from um, their home in Pakistan to India. And that was an incredibly uh, difficult time. They both suffered very significant losses personally um, in their family uh, and um, in terms of their possessions. And um, despite those difficulties, they were able to become surgeons, which was quite an accomplishment for my mother, because at the time her uh, father was laughed at for even bothering to educate his daughters, which he did. Um, and she became a surgeon um, and despite all odds. And she did that in a country where that was not necessarily the pathway for women. Um, they both moved to New York uh, eventually by way of Ohio um, in 1969, which is when they came to the United States. Um, and interestingly enough, um, it was in Ohio that I think my mother um, actually got the feeling that she would stay in the United States. And she often said that had she gone to New York first, she might never have stayed. She encountered some very um, wonderful people who really helped uh, her get settled in the United States. My father followed suit uh, and the two of them moved from Ohio to New York in 1970 and I was born in 1971. My mother switched careers from being an, uh, a surgeon to becoming a pathologist because somewhere along the way she had heard um, or at least got the idea that it would be very difficult for two surgeons uh, to have a family. And so she switched to pathology, which I think she resented for a very long period of time. And her experience absolutely was an influence on my experience. And so I ended up doing surgery, um, kind of following in the footsteps of my father, who was a neurosurgeon. Um, and uh, in, I ended up going back to Ohio to uh, Oberlin College, actually in Lorain County, where my parents actually first came to the United States. I was a neuroscience major. I developed, uh, I learned how to develop research questions while I was at Oberlin, which was always a huge uh, interest of mine. I learned that each answer in science uh, leads to more questions, which really um, put in my brain the idea of becoming uh, more and more inquisitive as my career went on. I went to Mount Sinai Medical School when I was done with college. I stayed there to do my general surgery. Um, residency in New York City. Um, I did a research fellowship at Rockefeller and I continued my fellowship in vascular surgery at Mount Sinai. And I followed that up uh, by coming to Pittsburgh. But the reason I really want, the thing I really want to highlight here is that while I was doing my research at Rockefeller University and I was so interested in kind of blending an, uh, a surgeon scientist career I didn't publish anything. I mean, and here I was, I was working with the department chair, the chair of medicine who was originally at Mount Sinai and then went to Rockefeller. I did two years of really intense basic research and didn't publish a thing. And that really ended up being an issue for me in a lot of ways um, that I thought was going to end up being like the kiss of death uh, for my career. But I went to Pittsburgh. I had really excellent um, mentorship uh, in Dr. Macaroon, uh, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Billier. I had some protected research time, which was very helpful. Uh, those of you who know what Pittsburgh's like is even protected research time is not truly protected <laughs> because it's very busy here. And so you end up getting pulled in a lot of directions, but I was able to build a clinical practice. A practice. I had access to resources and dedication from leadership 
um, in order to pursue these academic pursuits. And why is it important to do academics? I think in, in, in medicine, in one way or the other, and you can even do academics in private practice, is there is a tremendous value and precedent for being a person who walks the line between research and clinical care. And I think to some extent, we always, we all do that, regardless of whether we're in an academic practice or in private practice. And that surgical innovation has always involved some type of research, even if that means being critical about the procedures that you're doing and the results that you're getting. And our ability as surgeons to innovate, create, and accumulate um, huge uh, is a huge advantage to pursuing meaningful research that changes lives uh, for our patients. So despite the fact that I never published anything during my experience at Rockefeller University, I was able to benefit from the mentorship that I had and small, I got small foundational awards uh, to help me kind of build my research career and was eventually able to get NIH funding in the form of a career development award as a K08 in 2012 and finally an R01 in 2018. And this gave me the opportunity to hire help, to mentor students and residents, to collaborate within and across disciplines, and to travel and present my work, which really allowed me to build a network outside of my comfort zone. And as a result of that network, I was able to become a JBS reviewer, a key reviewer for the Journal of Vascular Surgery, make my way to the editorial board. I became an editor for JBS Vascular Science and uh, eventually transitioned to a JBS associate editor in the summer of 2020. And so what do I mean about building this network? I built the network based on um, my um, uh, small accomplishments um, with uh, research projects, you know, uh, getting abstracts accepted, going to present them. And then when I was at a meeting, I networked with people. I spoke to people outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and as a result, I was able to build connections. So for example, luckily I save all of my emails from like a decade ago. So I was able to come upon this email from 2013 where I emailed Dr. Dardick, um, Alan Dardick, who's always been a friend. I actually trained uh, with his father at Englewood in New Jersey. And um, I wrote him this email. I said, Dear Alan, if you should ever come across the need for a moderator, basic science reviewer, or mentor for students, keep me in mind. Um, and I need more experience in these areas. And I know um, that you could be a person to help me. Um, and then I you know, threw in a little nicety there. And he responded to me uh, the very same day. Nice to chat with you at VRIC, which was the Vascular Research Initiatives Conference. Um, and we need to catch up. And of course, I'm happy to keep you in mind. He says, I suggest you reach out to Peter Henke. So the next thing I did was I, reach, I reached out to Peter Henke by email. I said, hey, I'd like to be a reviewer for JVS. He made me a reviewer for JVS. Um, I started reviewing for the JVS, mostly in the basic sciences when um, that was, you know, when they were still included in the main journal. Um, and uh, this was my in. Eventually I ended up asking Peter if I could become a key reviewer um, and, or I think I asked him how I could get on the editorial board and he said, you need to become a key reviewer first. And he made me a key reviewer. Um, and so then I started reviewing a lot more. And then another opportunity came up in 2016 in which there was an editor position that was opening. Um, and I got an email to apply and I did. And I remember speaking with Dr. Dr. Sklavitsky and Dr. Lawrence um, and I didn't get the job, <laughs> but I didn't get the job, but they put me on the editorial board, which was wonderful. Um, and that was my entrance into some of the more senior positions. And so because of my longstanding relationship with Alan Dardick, because I think I, I kind of proved myself as being a person who could walk the line between basic science and clinical vascular surgery, I uh, was nominated and then eventually accepted the position to be a JVS vascular science editor. Uh, or co-editor with Alan and with John Kirchy and with Ulf Hedden. So that was actually really a wonderful opportunity for me to really start to understand what it means to be an editor. And then over the summer of um, 2020, when a position came open to be a, um, an editor with for the Journal of Vascular Surgery main journal at, with a focus on DEI concerns, um, I took that opportunity to apply for it and I eventually got it. And I think I had a lot of experience dealing with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, uh, issues um, when I was in college and had always been part of my career. And I think that set me up to be uh, where I am today. 
So if I had to give advice to junior people who are coming behind me, I think there are some very key points. Um, build a network. And that means uh, getting out there, trying to get your work out. Even small presentations can make a big difference. When you're at a meeting, get up and ask a question. That's always a good way to get a little bit of face time. Uh, be persistent. Ask for opportunities. And I think very often we are sitting in the background waiting for someone to ask us. Well, really, we need to take, you know, take the reins and, and ask. And that's all I needed to do in a lot of cases was to ask. And people were very receptive to that. Um, and follow through uh, and be, be, be responsible um, when you get these opportunities and uh, don't be a sloucher, which none of us are. Um, and I, you know, I, I thank, really I do thank my parents. They both, both uh, passed away, unfortunately, but for their persistence and for their um, strength in the face of very intense adversity at times, um, because that taught me um, and I will say that, you know, they definitely experienced a fair amount of um, bias and, and, and racist comments, I think, uh, quite honestly. Um, but I, I never forget the fact that they made the choice to come to the United States and they weren't brought here. Um, and, and, and I think the fact that they made the choice kind of differentiates their experience. Um, you know, I think they experienced a lot of difficulties, but it's different than what, let's say, um, the African American community or Hispanic community or Native American communities experienced. It's, it's, it was a very, very different experience, um, but one that I think was very impactful for me regardless. So thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much for that insightful talk. Um, Dr. Glowitzki needs no introduction, and he's going to be asking a question for Dr. Sachdev. Thank you very much, uh, Anil Ulka. This was an outstanding talk. I enjoyed it very much. It uh, has been a, a real pleasure working with you as our new associate editor of the JBS with focus on uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And uh, of course, as the program director of our JVS internship program. So uh, we all agree that uh, diversity of the editors and editorial board is essential. Uh, and you talked about how to find the opportunities, how to develop the experience and expertise, but you did not talk about unconscious bias. And that has <laughs> been a major barrier. So my burning question is, what is the most effective way to address unconscious bias of the publication committee who picks the editors and of the editors who pick the editorial board to, uh, to achieve diversity? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think, you know, most people would say when it comes to unconscious bias, is understanding that we all have it. Um, we all have it. And so that is a key step in recognizing that um, it exists. And if we have it and we are being, we are the people who are responsible for picking papers or pick, picking people to review papers, that that, is go that might work its way into our selection process. In fact, I think unconscious bias ends up playing a fairly large role in why some communities feel that it's difficult to build that very important network in order to be able to advance. So understanding that it exists in our systems, I think is um, a key point. As you know, we are trying to figure out a way to make the journal itself, and most academic journals I think are trying to do this, to have some kind of accountability for the process. So when I know when I, as in, in my editorial position, when I am picking people to review a paper, I try to make that reviewer panel as diverse as possible. I will pick from the editorial board, I'll pick a new reviewer, I will try to make sure that both genders or all genders are represented. And to whatever extent I can, if I know, I will try to make it a, a racially diverse panel as well. There are of course limitations in that, but I think that helps bring a broader perspective. 
I think also understanding that we need to intentionally broaden our reviewer pool by going and trying to recruit people of all different types to be reviewers for the journal. That also helps. A few ideas have come up in our internship um, to try to diversify the process of picking reviewers for papers. One is to have some kind of accountability um, on the editor's side to say, you know, you've picked this, you know, to, to kind of account for how many times you keep picking the same reviewer. Because if you, that might be something that we don't even realize that we're doing, that we keep going to reviewer A over and over and over and over again, probably because they respond and because they give good reviews. Um, but if there's a way that we can be uh, reminded of who we're picking and who we're not picking, uh, that might be another way. So I think it's a work in progress, but there's a lot of tools out there that we could tap into. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sachdev and Dr. Glavitsky. So we're gonna move on to uh, Dr. Anita uh, Dua from Harvard University will present tips and pearls for young Asian Americans who want to make a dent in vascular surgery. Uh, Dr. Dua. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, have um, known everyone on this panel as well. It's such an honor to be able to speak. And um, uh, I will be repeating some of the things that are, are said, but in, in a different viewpoint, specifically a younger one. Um, I went to Stanford for my vascular surgery fellowship. And then my first job has been at Mass General. I'll be now going into my third year this September. And so younger and you know lucky enough to be able to make it um, to where I am today. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the things I've learned along the way. So the title of my talk is about making a dent. So what does that really mean? I mean, this is a quote from Steve Jobs, just a throwback to my California days. And he's right. You know, we're here. We work so much. We do so much stuff. What is the point if you're not making a dent? And making a dent means different things to different people. To me, it specifically means being a powerful academic surgeon, taking great care of patients and training the next generation. And to that end, vascular surgery is full of these opportunities. In fact, they come at you from all directions, as Dr. Suchdev just said, you know, they're everywhere. In fact, there's so many opportunities that you can get paralyzed by indecision. What should I do next? Where should I invest my time? Especially as you start moving through life. I've got a couple of kids. I have a mother-in-law who gives me issues. And so I've got a lot of things that I have to deal with, but um, I needed to pick the right moves, the smart moves to hopefully be able to move ahead. And ultimately kind of harness all these opportunities and ride this dragon to the top and make that dent that's actually worthwhile, not just in your CV so that you can, you know, ultimately get a position and be able to stamp it on your white coat. But actually when you die, people will be like, oh, when Dr. X did this, I'm, I'm remembering them for X, Y, Z. So I've got a few tips and tricks that I want to give out to my uh, colleagues coming up behind me and even my, 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 my junior uh, faculty colleagues about how I felt this was successful in my way. And I'm sure there's some people that would disagree, but I think of course, this is the way to go. So first of all, as a young attending or a young trainee, you have to be very clear about what your professional passions are, but you cannot be rigid. I found it shocking that when I was going through the job process, some of my colleagues would go to like a chief of a division where they wanted to be the new attending and they would say, oh, I don't do veins. I don't do dialysis. I don't do this. I don't do that. I wanna be the aortic chief, it's absurd. That entitlement basically is something that needs to just go out the window. I'm not saying you need to roll over and you're not meant to lie. So you don't lie about your passions and go to your chief and say, oh, I'll do veins all day long when in actuality you want to be the PAD guru. But you know, if you were walking up to somebody, for example, I was lucky enough to walk up to Dr. Eagleton during the VAM a few years ago and say, I'd love to you know, come work with you. And he asked me, you know, what are your passions? And I, I said, you know, ACGME wise, I can do anything and I'm ready to do anything, but I have a passion for peripheral artery disease and I'd like to build your program. So they, I kind of answered it in this form. I knew what he needed and I knew what I needed and I was willing to have that symbiotic relationship to uh, allow this to blossom and ultimately to gain his trust and get more opportunities and be able to rise up the ranks. So important that as you go out there in the job market, you know, be a team player. It is a family. You're with these people all day long and you want to be somebody that they think, yeah, that person will get the job done competently and simultaneously want to help you achieve your goals. The second big thing is that you have to embrace the academic prowess, basically. You cannot say, I'm going to do just one piece of it. In this day and age, to be successful and make that dent, you have to be the triple threat from the olden days, as in you have to have education. <laughs> 
you have to have the ability to be clinically competent and you have to publish. So one of the pieces of advice actually Dr. Murray Shames gave me was that when you start out, you wanna build that reputation of competence. So the hundred wins idea, as in you start working, pick the cases that you, you know, can do competently and well, and the ones that you can't necessarily do by yourself, there's no shame in asking a senior partner. And the, the, I mean, the straight up statement to say about that is that no one is gonna remember that I called in Dr. Eagleton to help me through a difficult thoracle. But if I kill somebody, literally everybody will remember that for eternity. And then they'll call me a bad surgeon and then bad things will come of that. Cause as you know, these reputations blossom and they you know, get a life of their own. So you wanna have those hundred wins. No one can question your surgical skills. But the next piece of that is publishing is not optional. It's not something you do on the side. It's not something well, I'm gonna get my feet wet and then I'm gonna start. If you wanna make that dent, as again, Dr. Suchdeb just said, you really have to, have to embrace the research realm. And as you get deeper and deeper into being an attending and further, you do need to come down on a niche because you need to start to develop that national reputation because that's gonna take you to promotion. So you publish, you stay relevant, that creates that national reputation and ultimately you go on to get promoted. Um, and this, I feel, at least the way I've been successful, is really a symbiotic dance with my trainees. Everybody has needs and motivations when you're trying to lead a, a group. And so you find out what they need and you work with them to see how you can submit grants and how you can get things published. So what, what I do, for example, is none of my trainees, if they work with me, ever get anything except first authorship. So if you, they do the work, they get first authorship. And I, I, I'm, I'm loud about their accomplishments. I make sure it's brought to our research meetings and give them again what they need to succeed, help them get their jobs. And in exchange, they help me with my research. And the most important thing I think on this slide is you can't be that guy. And that guy is the mean surgeon, you know, the old way, like the guy's throwing things and screaming and yelling or girl, you know, mean, abrasive, because everybody hates that guy. It's not cool anymore. You know, like it used to be, oh, that guy's so tough and so great. No, everyone just thinks that person is now a loser. So not only do you need to be approachable, affable, available, like everyone has been saying, but you also just need to be cuddly. And at the same time, show that you are indeed a boss by being able to do all the other things. When people think about you, they need to think pleasant thoughts. That's the best way to put it. It shouldn't be something that they can just focus down on and say, that's not someone great. Um, the other thing, these are just a couple more points, is that only you know when you're doing too much. People tell me this all the time. You're taking on too much. You're doing too much. Basically, they're just projecting. It's what they maybe can't do. But if you know that you can do it, you should take it on and do it well. This is your time to do it as a young person. You've got the energy. You know, Drink a couple of Red Bulls and get it done. And that will pay you dividends in the future because people will come at you thinking this is a person that can get the job done competently and effectively. And then you're a reviewer A who gets that review again and again and again and ultimately climbs the chain. But really, really key, if your ultimate goal, which mine is, is to ultimately chair a department, you need to be thought of as a leader, thought of as someone approachable, intelligent, but also somebody with integrity. And I'm not talking about, you know, you steal the cookies from your drawer. I'm talking about the integrity where you show loyalty to your division and your colleagues. And I've been guilty of this. I've talked nonsense about my colleagues. I've done bad things. And I've learned from that because whoever you're speaking to, you might as well be broadcasting it to the department. So you need to be very careful, refrain from getting involved in office politics, bad mouthing others, behave like a leader, you know, and to make that dent in vascular surgery and climb that ladder, you don't want people to lose respect for you. So that comes obviously from being confident, obviously from being affable and being published and being what people would perceive as a boss, but simultaneously maintaining that human grip. You're going to have admins that you're over, you're going to be going to meetings and you want to be approachable and kind. So in conclusion, these are the, the, the factors I think that really have kind of brought together to help me build what I think today is a successful practice and with, which will hopefully continue to rise. You gotta work smart and hard. Bring in a group of residents that you can work with and build a team. Don't make excuses for stuff. It's a free country. If someone gives you an opportunity and you don't wanna do it, don't whine. Take it if you can do it. And if you can't do it, you know, explain yourself and in the future hope that that person comes back. When you do get an opportunity, you must deliver. Be on time, do it right, do it smart, so that people come back again and again to your store. And most importantly, when you do it right, be loud about it. You don't have to brag, you don't have to be arrogant, but people need to know what you did. You are just that piece of paper that might go in front of a board someday to be picked as an editor. Put the stuff on your CV, tell people what you're doing, but at the same time, ensure that you don't come across as somebody who's you know just showing off. And by the way, that, that is very different from men and women. 
So when women speak, there's a very particular way, unfortunately, that we do have to speak to not show that we're trying to be so great, but simultaneously maintain that you are somebody who's reliable. And finally, publish and teach and share those opportunities, bring others up with you. Our whole species survived because of collaboration. That's why Homo sapiens are all over the planet today. And other species didn't make it because they didn't collaborate and they just bashed each other's brains in and they're now dead. So remember, be collaborative and your species will make it all the way to the top. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Dua, thank you very much. Uh, I think you need to work a little bit on your enthusiasm, but uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, no, that was a great talk, and I, I may ask you for your slides to uh, show to our fellows when they're leaving and becoming young attendings. I think you made a lot of good points. All right, Dr. Frank Veith will uh, comment and ask you a burning question. Dr. Veith. Yeah, Anahita, that, that was a great talk. All the other talks have been really, in my opinion, spectacular. And I really would like to congratulate the organizers for putting this session on identity and diversity on. I'd just like to make one comment. I think that, and I'm gonna bring up the 400 pound gorilla in the room. I think identity, <clears throat> diversity, critically important, but they should be, uh, taken into account while recognizing the excellence and achievements of those being whose careers are being advanced because of this identity diversity situation. In other words, that shouldn't be done simply to promote individuals who don't measure up. And that's something we all have to be careful about. Bias controls everything we do. Several people said that. And my question for Anahita is, I happen to have a very positive bias toward Asian Americans. We talked about some of the negative biases that uh, are out there. My bias is a positive one because of the fact that they have achieved so much in sometimes a hostile environment. We've heard about that today. So Anahita, do you think, I know we should eliminate negative bias, but what do you think about positive bias like mine? Should I give that up and uh, not think that Asian American uh, men and women in vascular surgery are probably superior to me and others. Thank you very much, Dr. Ravid. That's actually a great question. And you know what? I'm I'm perfectly fine answering it because if we don't have the conversation, what's the point, right? So that's that's a fantastic question because you're saying what other people think. And here's here's what I think about that. The problem with bias is in the same way that the the community you know, is perceived as having done well, right? And you give positive points to a particular community. There's possibility then that other communities get negative points for what they are. And so the danger is that you get into a situation where you make assumptions about, let, let's say that, you know, you're, you're, to your point that, that, you know, the Asian American community's done well, and you get someone who comes into your office to, for a job, and that person's an Asian American. You're like, oh, yes, you know, I know they're going to work hard. I know that their parents have taught them right. I know that they're going to have good grades. I know that they're going to be reliable. And then they're not, you know? Yeah, and so that's the a problem. Is, yeah, it's a, but now you're stuck because, you know, and simultaneously, somebody else might walk through the door of a different ethnicity or, or even, you know, the same. And you might think, ah, you know what, mm, I don't know, the last time, blah, blah, blah. And then you think, OK, maybe maybe not this person because it creeps in there. So the danger is that, you know, when you have that stuff creeping in, you're, you're, you get blinded to the important factors about a particular job. Because, you know, the world is a different place today. The way that even, you know, regardless of race and whatever, actually just culturally, you know, the way that millennials behave are, is different than the way people from World War II behaved is different than the way I'm sure, you know, the next generation is gonna behave and what they consider important. So it, it could be anything, it could be youth, it could be skin color, it could be ethnicity. But if you pick based on these things, you pick based on only what you know, not necessarily what that person may may bring to the table. And then you you basically might make the wrong decision, whichever way you go. So I guess to be safe, the safest thing to do is try to eliminate all bias. So you, so you know, you should think it to yourself. You should, if somebody walks in the door, think, okay, I do have this unconscious bias where, or I used to be conscious at that point, because you'd know you have it. <laughs> and you'd say, I do think that this person might do well. Let me check this out. Let me ask them the same questions as everyone else. 
Let me make them take a test. You know, I have a friend out in California who basically makes voice go away during um, interviews and makes all, it's an IT, makes all the IT people take a very particular coding test regardless in, in blind race and blind uh, gender. And then they pick the best person to do the best coding. Now that has its own problems because you don't get to test the human element of it. But at the same time, it takes away some of the major biases. And so, and, and she's been successful. Her outcomes are very good. So I guess the point of the story is whatever bias you have ultimately can hurt you because you could be wrong. And so the best thing to do is just throw it out the window start fresh with every person that walks in and try to give them the best like equal shakedown and take the best person for that particular thing. I totally agree with you. Never pick someone who's subpar just because you're trying to achieve some, you know, some goal. But at the same time, you have to recognize that why do you consider that person subpar? What opportunities that they that they have? Like, what are you looking at that's determining that person to be subpar? It could be something that was out of their control or something where they were unfairly looked at. You know, for example, the USMLE score thing that's going on now. And so I think once we start to analyze that and it comes into our conscious, we'll be much better off and we'll pick much better people and, you know, advance the specialty. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dua. That, that was a great response. And I think we need to move on. We have 15 minutes and we still have another presentation and discussion. So, uh, Anil? So Dr. Bibi Lee is going to be giving the next talk and changing gears a little bit and talking about uh, lessons learned for the road uh, to the road to becoming a president of a vaster society. Dr. B.B. Lee? Mm -hmm. Can you see the slide? Hello. Not yet. You need to double click on that uh, on that link. That's uh, how to promote Asian American link. You gotta double click it, BB. Can you share it, Keith? No, you have to Just double, double click, click the thing you got up there. Okay, let's go back here. Can you see? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you got it. You're good to go, Dr. Lee. Let's see. I like to use this one for share. Uh, Good, anyhow. Okay. Well, good morning. I would like to thank to Enrico and organizing committee together for this unique opportunity to share my opinion on Asian vascular surgeon. I have no conflict of interest. I came to Richmond, Virginia in 1968 to start my transplant surgery fellowship under the late date of June. I was known as the one and only foreigner of Asian background to everyone there. Even after becoming an established transplant and a vascular surgeon at the Georgetown University of Washington, DC, I was often jokingly introduced by that same title for many decades afterward, even to our own human surgical society. So I was keenly aware of my unique status as an unusual minority and accepted as a reality. But it was also liability and to compensate, I had to work harder than anyone else. I survived the pyramidal system but I always remained as a second fiddle, assisting senior surgeon, and having to be content with being associate director of the program. But time has changed, and there's less discrimination, and so many first and second generation Asian Americans are now actively engaged in various medical specialties, including vascular surgery, with few restrictions, and I'm so proud of them. 
However, I cannot help but sometimes discern a difference in their behavior, including their reaction in a social setting from established white doctors. Of course, we all know that the cultural and familiar background we were raised in substantially impact overall behavior. Asian culture is quite different from American culture, which is basically Western and European culture. So Asian Americans can come up as generally modest, inhibited from public speaking and behaving as if they are guests and not the host. But society here in the US mandates that people get up and make their voice heard whenever there is a chance. That way others can understand your perspective, especially with a meeting as a vast society or a symposium. So I urge my colleagues of Asian origin to remember to speak up so that these other doctors can learn that you are as good as they are, if not better. You can also take advantage of unique cultural background they do not have. Furthermore, try not to be too modest and to participate actively in the vast society with enthusiasm. Join an area or project where your skill, knowledge, and experience can help your specialty and your fellow colleagues. Volunteer to participate in one or more committees to contribute further to your society. There are always equitable opportunities for Asian Americans in all vast societies to maximize the benefits having different backgrounds. Reach out to seek a well-deserved promotion when you let us well done, don't let them pass you over for one. Claim credit for what you deserve is another vulgar or shameful behavior. With the rise of racism against the minority in the US lately, we have to work even more vigorously to be successful. But when you succeed, you enable others in your shoes to success. Establishment will often make minorities feel the difference is a liability like they did with me, but difference is a benefit that nobody can take away from you. And even though diversity is a buzzword these days, but in reality, it takes a lot of work for organizations and the board to fully embrace it. So we have to push even harder for it. As Asian Americans, we deserve a seat at the table to claim it. No apology necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bibi Lee. Um, we're going to be getting a question from uh, Dr. Dahlman again, who needs no introduction. Dr. Dahlman, your question for Dr. Bibi Lee. Thank you, Neil. Good morning, everybody. Still morning here on the West Coast. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Keith and Frank and Enrico for uh, not only inviting me, but putting this important uh, symposium together. And certainly I've learned a lot. I appreciate uh, the ability to participate. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with your kind of lifetime observations, which obviously many of them are hard won. Uh, I'm not sure I have the perspective to ask the right questions based on the challenges you faced in your career. Um, but I do think that uh, if you look at the guidance that you have in your slide there in terms of recommendations, it kind of begs one obvious question. You know, obviously you've been successful and, and are happy with, uh, you know, the, what you've accomplished in your career. But if you had to do something differently in your own circumstance, was there a promotion that you felt you should have stepped up uh, and asked for? Or was there an opportunity that you felt you were denied or was there a situation where you would have behaved differently uh, given some of the challenges you outlined? Uh, I think the audience would be interested in learning how you address that yourself. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ron, for that um, very difficult question as a matter of fact. And uh, the current uh, American born, especially American trained Asian bachelor surgeons, will expect the same 
dividends like other uh, non-Asian you know, um, debt persuasion. But in my situation back in the late 60s, early 70s, I was not an American medical graduate. I was a so-called foreign medical graduate. I came late, start to uh, join to the world. So I knew exactly where I stand. So I never expected or claimed more than what I was able to get. So what I really like to tell Asian American uh, vascular surgeon is, I believe they can take advantage of their unique uh, background of different cultures, everything. They can do something a bit different of uh, way than other non-Asian uh, vascular surgeon. So just don't be modest and, and then do whatever you can, no other people cannot do, and then claim it. That's what I do. Don't, don't be shy and claim what you deserve to have it. That's my sort of uh, opinion at this time. Thank you. Enrico, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, fantastic talks, really. This is uh, a webinar for all times. Uh, Keith and uh, Anil, please, uh, we still have a few minutes and I think we should uh, open for discussion. I can see that Dr. Manju Carla uh, is on vacation and she really made a tremendous effort. Thank you so much. I know that many people will not take time of their vacation, but here you are, as usual, a major contributor to everything we do. So Carla, do you have, uh, from what you heard, do you, do you have any comment, any question to anyone? You, you're muted still. I know, I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> Go to somebody else, I'll come back. Okay, I'll do we, that. We can, we can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, Great. we can hear you. Go ahead. Wonderful. It's just not showing up on my screen. So yes, yeah. I really wanted to put my hand up and give you a little bit of a perspective from a female Asian surgeon, a little generation removed from doctors Dua and Sachdev. And uh, I think one of, the, uh, one of the big pieces of advice I give to to Asians, men and women who come for the first time to this country is of course, don't be shy, but also develop a thick skin and uh, getting a no again and again for your attempts doesn't kill you. And that's what I tell them. You have to be persistent because before coming to this country, I, there was no race issue where I fought to become a surgeon, but I fought the gender issue. And so I'd already developed a thick skin by the time I came here. Mm -hmm. And also unlike their experience, I think Bibi will, will uh, uh, attest to this. We <laughs> came and uh, tried to get noticed uh, well before the times where you could email and look for a mentor or opportunities. You really had to work hard to, apart from everything else, to be noticed uh, and be appreciated before the opportunities came your way. So one of the things that I always uh, tell the new young people who come is be honest, ask for what, you're, what you think you deserve or you want or you think you are capable of doing and develop that thick skin early because just because you get a no the first time or the second time, don't give up. And to Dr. Veet's point, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that as a woman, and although I, I must admit, I don't think my race played a big part in, in uh, getting me where I, where I need to be. Um, I do feel that we shouldn't give the next generation a free pass just because they're Asian or just because they're women. All of us need to earn the opportunities. Yes, Dr. V wants to talk. I just want to ask B.B. Lee a question. First of all, I enjoyed the last comment. Excellent, uh, Manju. The, my question to B.B. Lee is, do you think it's vulgar or bad if somebody else claims credit for work they didn't do? That happens a lot. 
Well, thank you, thank you, Frank. Well, that is a very delicate issue there, but uh, it <laughs> certainly is unfair to to allow somebody who claim for the credit they didn't deserve. So by all means, uh, it shouldn't be allowed for that. And so that's my feeling there. As a matter of fact, that remind me of same questions. I'm sure you, we all know Mel Williams and Hopkins who retired used to bring up that issue, same issue. So I, I guess, you know, um, uh, it does, they should know what they deserve to claim and should not claim more than what they deserve to claim. That's my sort of position especially on this uh, promotion tenure issue coming up, we always bring up that uh, one of uh, issues to discuss, but uh, that is a uh, human nature, we see them, but, uh, but uh, most of the time we just uh, intend to uh, tolerate, but we should not. Dr. Rebecca Ricci is a famous vascular surgeon in Mexico, a great person. She reminds us that all these issues discussed today are applicable to other ethnic groups as well, and Spanish and Latin American uh, uh, surgeons who feel the same. And you know, it's a very good thing that we brought it up. So it applies to different ethnic groups as well. They're all great pearls and great tips today. And I think uh, I don't want to hold you any longer from your uh, duties for the day. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's a great contribution. It's going to be memorialized at the V Symposium website. Uh, so you can, uh, can always get back to this uh, webinar. And hopefully we also translate this into a bulletin that's uh, read by 15,000 people in the United States, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and China. So uh, thank you again very much and um, have a great day. It was a great webinar. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Enrique. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Enjoyed it.